Exploring Idaho, the television adventure showcasing our state's unique people and places is brought to you by Albertsons, Southwest Airlines, the Idaho Department of Commerce, seven regional travel committees, and KTVB Channel 7. Coming up on Exploring Idaho, we'll go whitewater rafting on the Bruno River, a remote wild desert river of spectacular beauty. Next, climb aboard a wagon train to commemorate the immigrants who traveled the Oregon Trail. Finally, we'll take a step back in time when we go fossil hunting with paleontologists at the Hagerman Fossil Beds National Monument. Hello, I'm Dee Sarton, and welcome to Exploring Idaho. This sagebrush desert looks pretty desolate at first glance, but you know it has a way of growing on you, especially when you start discovering its secrets, like the fact that this desert is home to one of the world's greatest whitewater rafting rivers. It's the Bruno River in southwestern Idaho, and as you're about to see, it is one of the most remote and least discovered rivers in North America. To reach the spectacular Bruno River Canyon, you have to travel through a hot, dry desert. It's a journey of more than 50 miles over rough, dusty roads, and the last leg of the trip is especially difficult. But your efforts are finally rewarded with the sight of an oasis of lush green trees and the meandering river. Just right down here, just below where we came in on the road, the canyon's gonna close up really tight. Yeah. It'll be one of the prettiest parts of the whole trip. Filled with anticipation, no time is wasted getting on the water. This group of fathers and sons have traveled all the way from Georgia just to run this river. As the towering volcanic formations surround the tiny rafts, you suddenly feel very small compared to the grandeur of the canyon. There is also the eerie sensation that there is no turning back. This remote desert river and these steep rock walls will separate you from the rest of the world for the next 45 miles. You're pretty well stuck here. I mean, if you wreck your boat, you either gotta go down river or up river. You can't just climb out. Take a look at these cliffs right here. I mean, they're four or 500 feet of sheer rock. It's definitely one of my favorites and it's partly because it's so scenic but partly because of the isolation and the solitude that's available here. The quiet solitude gives way to the sound of the fast moving water of an approaching rapid. Here's where the skill of Guy John Griffith is essential. You just try to pick the best spot and slip through and uh, get an oar in when you can. It's fun, you know, when it gets a little tight.
Go to the left of this big rock. Yeah, go to the left over there. Okay, full speed ahead. The paddle boat requires teamwork and concentration to negotiate the rocks in the river. Eager paddlers have a good instructor on board. Janet Kellum has been a river guide for nearly 15 years. The paddle raft takes a real commitment from everybody. You just don't know what's around each corner, and it happens fast. For a little more excitement, inflatable kayaks give you a one-on-one -on -one experience with the power of the Bruno River. On some of them, it's really just a tight squeeze, and it's just such a rush when you're going over the big rapids, you know. If you're nervous about some rapids coming up, it gives you some confidence if you can do it. Soon, a carefree spirit emerges. As you travel deeper into the canyon, the rhythm of the flowing river seems to carry away the worries of the outside world. We're trying to get away from the whole aspect of having to be someplace at a particular time. Uh, we just refer to it as river time. No watches needed on this trip. The deepening shadows on the canyon rim tell time. Evening is approaching. It's time to make camp and prepare dinner over an open fire. The light in the canyon here is fantastic. It's beautiful and, and it's changing every minute. It's like the show's constantly changing. There's nothing the same and you're always discovering something new and you watch the birds that are just way up on the walls and there's so much to see. After a restful night, the sun is right on time with a spectacular wake-up call, a call to explore a nearby gorge. A year-round resident of the canyon lets visitors know he's not used to all this attention. Okay, this is miner's lettuce here. The leaf here is, is edible. It's pretty tasty. It's actually better than lettuce, you know, regular lettuce. Eat it? Yeah. Cool. You just but you can eat, eat the whole plant. The peaceful isolation of this canyon gives you an intimate experience with nature. No interruptions from the outside world. Your only concern is drifting the swirling waters of the Bruno River. When you can turn on some city people to the environment and have them go home with a little more respect for it, that's probably one of the, the big uh, joys you get from this type of work. I wouldn't pick it as their first trip. They need to have a little more experience before they get in here. I've seen a lot of wrecked boats, especially on the lower part of this river. The rapids are going to be steeper, a lot longer. There's going to be a lot more big rocks in the river. Mother Nature is in charge here, and her personality changes dramatically as the Bruno River offers up five straight miles of jarring rapids. This lower stretch is the toughest test for the rafters. It's a tight squeeze through the maze of boulders. The rapids have to be carefully scouted before going any further. There are only a few weeks out of the year that it's even safe to run this stretch. It requires experience, teamwork, and a grab onto your seat, go for it kind of attitude. It's exciting, sometimes it's even a little bit scary. There were times when I wondered how things were gonna turn out. <laughs> Here I am a guide and outfitter, and I didn't want to advertise this trip because I didn't want people to know about it. And maybe that was kind of selfish, but that's how I felt. On the other hand, now we're seeing if you want to preserve it, a few more people got to know about it. The Bruno River Canyon to me is a very unique part of Idaho and a part of the country. It's the high mountain desert country. There's not very much of it left that's been undisturbed. So it's really a rare gem in the state. I'd love to see it protected forever. Absolutely incredible, but it is so tricky. If the water is too low, you just can't get around the rocks. On the other hand, if the water is too high, it's too treacherous. At any water level, it is not a river for the inexperienced. If you'd like to know more about the Bruno River, be sure to stay tuned. We'll have that information for you coming up. Still to come, Retrace the footsteps of early pioneers. Welcome back to Exploring Idaho. Here in the West, we love to hear stories of the Oregon Trail. 
It's History We Can Touch and Feel because the Oregon Trail is literally right out our back door. So today, meet some modern day travelers who are discovering firsthand the difference between the romance and the reality of the Oregon Trail. This is a scene straight out of the pages of history, covered wagons rolling across the Snake River Plain of Idaho. In the mid-1800s, thousands of immigrants headed west over the Oregon Trail in search of a better life. Now, a dozen families from throughout the country and as far away as England are retracing part of the historic route. They'll take nearly a month to cover what is called the Goodell's Cutoff. It's a 230-mile-long alternate route off the main Oregon Trail. The cutoff winds from Fort Hall near Pocatello to the Boise area. In the 19th century, this was an extremely difficult, even life-threatening journey. Today's pioneers may have it slightly easier, but they are definitely experiencing some of the hardships of traveling by covered wagon. It's everything that you read about. It's dirty and it's hot, it's dusty and it's sagebrush. It isn't easy. We've been in some really tremendous dust out on the desert, but, but we got it so much easier than what the pioneers had it. For 78-year-old Les Brody, this is a journey to rediscover his heritage. Les is the grandson of a pioneer family who came to this area. I've been wanting to do it for several years because my grandmother made three trips across this trail and I wanted to see why she was tougher than me. The family settled close to one of the traditional stops along the cutoff near what eventually became the small town of Martin. Though there's not much evidence of Martin today, it still makes a good camp spot, just like in the past. If you read back in some of the diaries, that was what they called a good camp. Load them up! Move them up! The Goodells Cutoff saw its heaviest use in the early 1860s when the northern Shoshone and Bannock tribes began resisting the onslaught of settlers. Though somewhat safer, the cutoff wound through some very rugged lava-filled landscape near what is now called the Craters of the Moon. Notice the lava flow beside you and the mountain is on the right of you. There's no other way they could go. You know, we at least have a trail. You know, they were blazing a trail. You know, I, I really can't. I just... Sometimes <laughs> you almost get choked up with emotion thinking what they did. Linda Whitaker and her family are from Utah. Her husband Tom thinks this is a great experience for the kids. I'm doing this much for my children and I think that the parents back then were they were doing it for their children. I don't think they were doing it for themselves. My great great grandfather uh, George Whitaker drove uh, a wagon across the plains to Salt Lake City as a 19-year-old. My boy, he's driven most of the, the wagon train. When I see him, I kind of think of my grandpa. Third wagon train trip. Just love every bit of it. Many of the women on the trip are getting into the pioneer spirit by walking along ahead of the wagons. Susan Smith and her daughter Kay came all the way from England to capture the feeling of the Old West. This country is just so beautiful. I mean, the open spaces and the mountains and the smell of the sagebush, you can't get that anywhere else. This is as the pioneers would have done it. And we're living as the pioneers lived, which is wonderful for me. This, this makes the, the trip so special. It's a little deep feeling that you can't see. It's hard to imagine what they went through, and it just gives you something as if maybe you're touching them. That's what I get out of it. Really not that long ago when you think about it, but it's sure great to see those memories being kept alive. We'll be right back. Up next, searching for buried clues to Idaho's past at Hagerman Fossil Beds National Monument. Have you ever heard of the Hagerman horse? Well, back in the 1920s, the little town of Hagerman, Idaho, became the talk of the archaeological world. A farmer found the bones of a prehistoric horse south of town, and that horse is known as the Hagerman horse. Turns out, it was just the tip of the iceberg. Scientists are still talking about the amazing variety of fossils to be found in this part of southern Idaho. 
These high bluffs above the Snake River are jam-packed with fossils. That's why Congress created the Hagerman Fossil Beds National Monument in 1988. This area is being set aside to preserve the remarkable number and variety of fossil sites found here. Lying buried in sedimentary rock of the canyon rim are fossils eons old. The monument designation protects the fossils and at the same time makes them available to scientists, students, and park visitors. Everybody is able to see the fossils in their natural state and learn more about the ancient history of this fragile landscape. In places like this, wind and water have worked to expose the fossils. Access here is limited. A misplaced footstep could destroy valuable scientific information. That quest for information is what motivates paleontologist Greg McDonald. As we go from the top of the bluffs down to the river, each step that uh, we take, we're actually going back in time. You can sort of think of it like a treasure hunt, because when you go out, you're never quite sure what you're going to run across. So you've got to keep your eyes open. And we spend most of our time looking at the ground. Yeah, you can see some more fossil bone on the ground right there. This bone sticking up right here is the tail vertebrae to a beaver. And this bone here is part of the end of the upper arm bone that goes into the elbow joint to the beaver. What this is, is part of a leg bone of a small bird in the size range of a teal. Well, this is a fragment of turtle shell. It's very interesting that a lot of the animal life that we find here at Hagerman are what you would expect in a wetland habitat. So we find a variety of ducks, grebes, uh, we have the pelicans, cormorants, swans, geese. Uh, so the types of birds you would find in a wetland area today. Desert now, but definitely a wetland area three and a half million years ago. Evidence that this is a former wetland is clearly visible to the trained eye. This cemented sandstone and the sand going out behind me is all part of the old river channel. We're finding beaver, frog, fish, a variety of aquatic animals that formed the community that lived here. This is an area a lot of times where we'll get down and start prospecting and looking to see if there's any bone. If you get down on your hands and knees, get your nose about six inches away from the ground, then's when you start finding the small animals. That little white thing right there is a single vertebrae to a snake. And then right next to it, that little black thing right there is a single tooth to a little mouse. That's what we call the incisor or the gnawing tooth out of a mouse-like animal, uh, probably related to the field mice of today. If we're trying to understand the changes on this planet and how plants and animals have responded to environmental change, to climatic change, we really need to understand the ecology of these small animals because they're very sensitive environmental indicators. The earth is forever changing. Hagerman Valley was once a floodplain for a huge lake equal in size to the modern day Great Lakes. The ancient body of water known as Lake Idaho was filled with rich deposits of sediments from the ancestral Snake River. Scientists believe about 15,000 years ago, a huge wall of water called the Bonneville Flood ripped through the valley. The water from the flood came down the canyon from Twin Falls and basically came right down the canyon through there where the river is. And then when it hit this valley, basically spread out. And that's one of the reasons why on the floor of the valley there, you find all those rounded uh, boulders of basalt. The vast flood that carved out the Snake River Canyon also unveiled the rare fossils buried deep within the Earth's sediments. The most significant is the horse for which Hagerman fossil beds are most noted. In 1930, the Smithsonian Institute began excavation in the now famous horse quarry. Over 150 horse fossils were uncovered. That represents the largest single sample ever found. This uh, jaw fragment is uh like what would be found if we were to uncover more of the bone bed here. This is the first molar and you can see it's heavily worn. So based on what we have here, we can say we've got a, a full adult and the amount of wear would suggest that we're probably dealing with an eight to 10 year old. Though extinct now, the horse flourished in a mystical savanna type environment. They shared this landscape with many animals similar to those we find living today. But 
The only clues to their existence lie buried in their fossilized remains. The only way we can understand that history is the fossil record. And there's very few places like Hagerman that provide enough diversity to really understand what has happened through time. If you're interested in visiting the monument, several activities are planned this summer. If you'd like more information, have a pen and pencil handy. I'll have a phone number you can call for more information on the Hagerman fossil beds and the other places we've visited in today's show. Welcome back to Exploring Idaho. Now let me tell you how you can get more information on the places we've visited on today's show. Just call 1-800-443-2461. Ask for the field notes for Exploring Idaho show number 114. As we've seen on today's show, the sprawling Idaho desert is a unique place full of surprises. At first glance, the vast expanse of the Craters of the Moon National Monument looks like a desolate wasteland. But mysterious, timeless beauty awaits you if you're willing to explore the massive lava formations. At sunset, the play of light across this lunar landscape creates an ever-changing scene of color, silence, beauty. Thanks for being with us and join us again next month as we continue exploring Idaho.